My name's Tom Scott, and I've been a freelance copywriter for about 15 years now. In this presentation, I'm going to be talking about the various sorts of things that copywriters do, and the sort of things that you might be doing if you choose to follow the business writing option that I teach later on in the course. As you go through the presentation, you'll notice that there are links out to various websites where you can find out more about the things I'm talking about. If you feel like a break from my voice, you're welcome to follow these. You can get back to the main presentation just by closing the window that they open in. Or you could always go back and follow these links later on, if you prefer. Before we get down to business, as it were, here's a trivia question. What do all of these authors have in common? Well, it's probably not too hard to guess that they've all worked as commercial copywriters. Salman Rushdie came up with the memorable slogan, Naughty But Nice, which was used to sell cream for the Milk Marketing Board back in the 1960s. Around the same time, Fa Faye Weldon was responsible for the famous Go To Work On An Egg slogan. And Elmore Leonard, who I think is one of the finest living novelists, put in about 15 years at a copywriting agency in Detroit, writing everything from marketing brochures to corporate film scripts. Will Self, astonishingly, spent a couple of years working for a corporate publisher, uh, and among other things he did for them was to produce the Safeway's in-house staff newsletter. It's rather mind-boggling to try to imagine how this might have read if he'd written it in the style of his later novels. More towards the sublime end of business writing is this poem by W. H. Auden which was written for a Royal Mail publicity film in the 1930s. You can see an excerpt on YouTube by following the link. More recently, the Royal Mail hasn't been quite so inspiring when it comes to public relations. In fact, it was responsible for one of the most disastrous rebranding exercises ever when it decided to change its name to Consignia a few years ago. But that's another story, as they say. The phrase business writing probably conjures up images of grey men in grey suits churning out grey turgid prose about sales figures and profit drivers and so on. And that's of course why we've sexed it up by calling it writing creatively for business. Maybe we should have called it how to sell your soul to the devil and have fun doing it, or turning words into major cash. But actually I don't think that writing for business has to mean selling your soul to the devil. And I'm sorry to say that a career as a business writer is not necessarily a surefire way to riches. But it's probably true to say that it's easier to make money out of this kind of writing than it is out of most other kinds. When I say easy, I don't want to give you the idea that it's money for old rope. It's often hard work. In fact, pretty much any kind of writing is going to be hard work if you're doing it properly. I'd also be lying if I told you that every job you do is going to get your creative juices gushing any more than every piece of journalism, or indeed fiction, is going to be a mind-boggling example of out-on-the-edge creativity. But it certainly can be fun, and creatively challenging. So, one of the things I'll be doing in my unit is showing you some ways you might not have thought about to make money out of your skills as writers. And that's not unimportant, especially when an awful lot of authors earn incredibly little from their work. Just to illustrate that point, a few years ago the Society of Authors did a survey of its members which showed that three quarters of them earned less than half the national average wage from their writing. Actually these figures don't necessarily mean that the majority of authors are living on the breadline, because of course a lot of writers also do other things apart from writing to make ends meet. But they do help concentrate the mind, I think. This is a very rough guide to what you might expect to earn as an established freelance copywriter. As these figures suggest, the range is quite wide and depends very much on the sort of work you're doing and who you're doing it for. It also depends where you're working. London rates tend to be quite a lot higher than the kind of rates you can expect to charge working for companies based in Cornwall, for instance. But if we put these figures next to the stats from the Society of Authors we saw a minute ago, 
I guess it's fair to say that a busy freelance copywriter should take about 6 to 12 weeks to earn what an average author earns in about a year. One thing I'd stress is that a lot of the principles of business writing are no different from those of other kinds of writing. And a lot of the techniques that you'll be practicing with Helen and Derek are also things that we'll be using in my unit. I'm talking about things like identifying and connecting with an audience, establishing tone of voice, telling human stories in a fresh and engaging way. If you can do those things for business clients, then there are plenty of people out there prepared to pay you quite well to do so. And many copywriters combine this sort of work with other sorts of writing that don't tend to be quite so lucrative. I'd also stress that writing for business can be rewarding in other ways than simply financially. And you might be quite surprised at the size of audiences you're able to engage with. One of the first press releases I ever wrote was for Thomas Cook, the travel company. At the time, I was working as a TV researcher for an independent producer, and one of the things they were making was something called a video news release to celebrate Thomas Cook's 150th anniversary. They'd recreated the first ever packaged tour that Thomas Cook himself organised, which, amazingly enough, was a railway trip between Leicester and Loughborough, and they'd filmed it using a bunch of actors in Victorian costume. I'd helped to set the whole thing up, and they gave me the job of writing a press release to send out along with the video package to the TV stations around the world that they sent it to. I'd done a bit of journalism before, but I'd never actually written a press release, and to be honest I was pretty stumped by the challenge of turning this thing into anything resembling a genuine news story with international appeal. But after racking my brains for a bit, I plumped on what no doubt seems pretty obvious to you which is to focus on how this radical new idea of package travel ended up changing the world. So I did a bit of research into travel statistics and dug up a few startling figures, such as that the average person in 1850s England travelled a total of 13.5 miles a year, whereas today's Brit notches up something like 15,000. Anyway, I wrapped up all of this into a story under the headline A Short Trip That Changed the World, and was amazed when the monitoring statistics for the video news release came back. It had been picked up by TV stations all around the globe and seen by an audience of around 200 million people. And most of the stations that used it had based the accompanying story pretty closely on the text of the press release that I'd written. It's not going to cut much ice with JK Rowling, of course, but it's still quite satisfying to know that something you've written has reached such a big audience. Anyway, I suppose it was what got me started thinking about actually making a living as a business and publicity writer. Ironically enough, I don't think anything I've written since then has achieved such a big reach. Writing press releases is of course just one small aspect of writing for business, which is a field that spans a huge number of different formats. The simplest way of categorising these is to divide them into long copy and short copy forms. You can see a few examples of each here. By the way, the shortest form of all is naming, coming up with names for new brands and products. It can also be one of the best paid, particularly if you're working for one of the big agencies that specialises in this sort of work. Some writers will specialise very much in one kind of writing, others like me are more jacks of all trades. In any one week, I might, my f I might find myself writing anything from a print ad for a bank to an interactive training DVD for a not-for-profit agency. Sometimes I'm asked simply to supply a few words of copy for a visually-led concept created by a designer. Sometimes I have to come up with the whole concept and copy for a brochure or a website or even the entire contents of a magazine. Personally, I find this kind of variety quite refreshing. In some ways it's not too surprising that business writing is often seen as tedious and turgid because, in fact, a lot of organisations produce an awful lot of garbage that could fairly be described in those terms. Actually, this is all to the good if you know how to do it better. A lot of companies and government agencies seem to communicate in a kind of bizarre dialect of English. 
which they used to say very little at great length. One reason for this is that the stuff they churn out isn't actually written by people who have any training as writers at all, but by specialists who've been working in a particular area all their working lives, and they tend to forget that ordinary people don't know the first thing about whatever it is they're trying to communicate. I came across some fantastic examples of this a couple of years ago when I was working on a project for the Department of Trade and Industry, the DTI. They'd realised that many businesses find it incredibly hard to understand the maze of government regulations that they have to negotiate. And they wanted writers to try and translate some of these official regulations into language that people might actually be able to follow. They deliberately went for agencies and freelancers from outside the civil service because they thought that we'd be better at writing for ordinary people, partly because we were starting out from a position of no specialist knowledge. Anyway, this was one of the toughest writing jobs I've ever taken on. It was also one of the best, best paid, and rightly so, I think, given the kind of stuff we had to wade through and try to make sense of. Here's an example from the Department of the Environment. It's about environmental regulations that apply to business, and it's part of a kind of test assignment that was set for copywriters applying to work on that DTI project I just mentioned. So what is it that makes this kind of writing so horrifically unreadable, apart from the subject matter, which is certainly not all that fascinating? Well, where do you start? For one thing, it's totally impersonal. It gives you no feeling that any of this might actually apply to you, the reader. Using more concrete examples and addressing the reader personally can make a big difference. Another huge problem is that it doesn't explain the terms it's using. What's a stationary technical unit, for God's sake? After some research, I discovered that what they actually meant was a factory. You might also notice that it uses a lot of passive constructions, which is very typical of bureaucratic language. It's not just off-puttingly impersonal in itself, it also has the effect of making it hard to understand who's meant to be doing what. The sentences here are extremely long. You can't read that last one without pausing for breath a couple of times. And last but not least, it uses a lot of vocabulary that you'd never use in ordinary speech. Entails the requirement, for instance. Who would ever actually say that? You could make the first sentence here a lot more user-friendly just by changing it to to this one. To meet Criterion 2A, you have to be carrying out the activity so as to serve the factory, and you need to be doing this on the same site as the factory itself. It's still not wonderful, but at least it's clearer, and it sounds slightly more like something someone might actually say. And, by the way, one very good way of telling if a piece of writing is any good is to read it aloud. If it sounds stilted and unnatural, then there's probably something seriously wrong. That was rather an extreme example, but a lot of companies and other organisations have begun to realise that this kind of writing is a real problem, and it's certainly not doing much for their customer relations. And that's creating quite a lot of work for people who can write simple, clear, plain English, even about quite complex topics. That's one of the things we'll be focusing on in my unit, but by no means the only one. Being able to write clearly is actually a hugely worthwhile skill to develop. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that it's really the basis of all good writing, whether it's about business or anything else. But maybe we should just pause here for a moment to try to define exactly what we mean by business writing. Well, like all other kinds of writing, it's essentially the art of communicating meaning through the written word. A huge variety of meanings, in fact, from complex technical information, hard facts, to feelings and emotions. And it's in that last area that you're often able to use your creativity as a business writer. It may seem strange to talk about feelings in connection with business, but when you're talking about consumer behaviour, emotions play just as big a part as economics, if not more so. I'm going to wax a little bit philosophical here, but not for very long. 
so don't worry. A while ago, I used to teach an introductory sociology course, and one of the founding fathers of modern sociology was a guy called Max Weber. One of his key ideas was the notion of enchantment and disenchantment. Essentially, Weber argued that before the rise of science and rationalism, people lived in what he called an enchanted world, a world that was rich in magical meaning and association, where people had a strong sense of mystical or magical forces underlying the experience of everyday life. One of the effects of the rise of rationalism, he said, had been to dispel this sense of enchantment. But Weber saw this process of disenchantment as in many ways a tragic development, as it deprived people of this rich sense of underlying meaning, and eventually turned society into what he called an iron cage of arid rationalistic efficiency. What's all this got to do with business writing? Well, Weber was around at a very early stage in the development of what we now call the consumer society. And one of the biggest changes in the last 50 years or so has been the way in which companies have recognised that simply making and selling goods and services isn't enough. People are more than just consuming machines. They want to feel that the experience of buying and consuming is somehow meaningful. They seem to seek an emotional connection with what they're buying and the people they're buying from. So much so that some very large companies have stopped thinking of themselves as mainly producers and see themselves instead as so-called meaning brokers. And where there are meanings to be brokered, there's usually a writer at work somewhere helping to broker them. Now, you might think it's sad that people need to seek meaning and emotional fulfillment through their consumption choices, but I just say that it's human nature. Humans are creatures that seek out meaning in whatever they do, and if shopping and consumption become a major part of their lives, they seek to find or create meanings out of the different ways in which they consume. And their lives would be a lot duller, I think, if they didn't. This is maybe one of the most important things that copywriters seek to do, they can help make the experience of consuming or of working meaningful to people. In a way, you could call them enchanters. In Weber's sense, they've helped to re-enchant the experience of modern life. Here's a slightly scary fact. A couple of years ago, one of the big advertising agencies, Young and Rubicon, did a survey of people's attitudes to brands. They got responses from more than 45,000 people in 19 different countries. And among other things they claim to have found is that consumers actually find greater meaning in brands and the values they represent than they do in religion. Maybe Young and Rubicon were taking it a bit far to claim that brands are the new religion. But of course, they're an agency that specializes in branding and they certainly succeeded in generating huge amounts of media coverage when they released their survey findings under that headline. So one of the things we'll be looking at is branding, which is essentially the ways in which companies and organisations associate particular meanings and identities with their products and services, and the ways that they communicate these meanings. Obviously, not all of this is done with words. Visual identity, packaging, sponsorship also play a huge part. But in many cases, words are right at the heart of the process, and I'm not just talking about advertising copy. All the words that organisations use to communicate to the outside world contribute to people's perceptions and feelings about that organisation and what it does. In other words, they contribute to the brand identity. Everything from the phrases used by the people who answer the phone through to advertising, direct marketing mail shots, customer newsletters, press releases, even the kind of language used in their annual reports Used skillfully, all these words help to give an organisation a tone of voice. They help it to sound natural and warm and human, rather than like some hideous bureaucratic machine. Here's just one example. It's from the About Us section of the Prêt à Manger website. Have a read and ask yourself how they've managed to inject some personality into a piece of text that is often just deeply pompous and dull. 
Now, if you're cynical, you might say that all of this is just a way of disguising the money-making machinery, getting people to buy more of your products or invest in your company's shares. And of course, on one level, you'd be absolutely right. If you want people to buy, then communicating a well-recognized positive brand image is hugely important. When you talk about branding, people tend to think of the global mega brands, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Nike, and so on. And those have come to be associated with globalization in the worst possible sense. But of course, branding also underpins the success of very different kinds of operation. Companies like the Body Shop, for instance, or the Cooperative Bank. Both of those have projected very well-based images of ethical and social responsibility to build up large and loyal customer bases. So branding doesn't just work for multinational companies doing unpleasant things in third world countries. Smaller companies use similar techniques to relate to their customers, and so do many charities and non-profit organisations. And we'll be looking at examples of the kind of communications used by all these types of organisations in my unit. This isn't strictly to do with branding, really, but I couldn't resist showing it to you. It's the description of a pair of leather trousers being sold on eBay. Have a look. This actually became a quite celebrated pe piece of writing, and partly because it was picked up by bloggers and spread around the web that way. In fact, it notched up a record 3.4 million hits on eBay, and uh, also appeared in newspapers worldwide, including The Guardian, the New York Daily News, The Independent, um, as well as on national radio in the UK and the States. I read about it in The Guardian, which inexcusab inexcusably really didn't name the writer. But it's just such a perfectly achieved bit of wryly comic writing that I knew the minute I saw it, it was written by a pro. The punctuation alone, I think, gives it away. It's just so beautifully timed. Anyway, I did a bit of googling and found out that it had been written by a guy called Brian Sack. Um, Brian Sack has his own blog, and you'll see a link to it at the bottom of the slide here. Also, that Brian's blog had notched up two million hits just on the strength of this piece of writing alone. It's a wonderful example of sales writing elevated to a real art form, and also of how to use an unconventional publishing platform like eBay in this case to get known as a writer. I've talked quite a bit about what business writing has in common with other sorts of writing, but I'd like to look now in a bit more detail at what's actually different about the kind of writing we'll be doing on my unit. One alternative title for the unit might have been Writing That Makes Things Happen. Because the types of writing that we'll be looking at, what they all have in common is that they engage with the real world in a very direct way. Typically, they try to influence readers not just to think, but to act in a particular way. Of course, almost all writing tries to influence its readers one way or another, in the sense that it tries to engage them, to amuse them, to thrill them, or in one way or another keep them turning the pages. But I'm talking about writing that has rather more specific real-world objectives. Let's maybe take a look at these and what they might be. Well. Business writing tries to influence or help people to act, for example, by communicating factual information in a way that doesn't give the reader a headache. This is sometimes called technical writing, but it's not necessarily writing about technology. We'll be looking at things like how to structure and write factual reports, for instance. 
persuading people to fund a particular project or invest in a business. Knowing how to put together a convincing proposal is a really useful thing to know how to do, even if you don't end up doing it for a living. And actually, it's quite possible to make a good living out of writing proposals for other people and organisations, if you're that way inclined. Persuading people to buy a particular product or support a particular cause. We won't be looking so much at the really big budget stuff that's done by major ad agencies for TV ads and poster campaigns, uh, partly because there's a separate course at Falmouth that covers that kind of advertising. But we'll be looking more at the kind of copy that's written for brochures, for mail shots, for websites, for example. As we all know, the world is absolutely saturated with sales copy. So how do you write a mail shot that doesn't go straight into the bin? Or a web page that stays on screen for more than five seconds? There's another difference between this kind of writing and other sorts, and that's that you can usually measure its success rather more objectively. If a company or a big public organisation is spending a lot of money on a rebranding exercise or a marketing, marketing campaign, then they'll want to know that it's money well spent. So they'll almost always follow up the campaign with some research to try to find out how effective it's been. How has the target audience responded? Have they gone out and spent more money on the product? Do they feel differently about the organisation thanks to its new brand identity? How many column inches have been generated by a PR campaign? These things are all measurable. And for the same kind of reason, a lot of planning and research is usually done before anything's actually written. Of course, it's always important for writers to understand the audience for whatever it is they're writing. But in business, business writing, this kind of understanding is maybe even more vital. And you have to do more than just understand the target audience or target market. As a writer, you have to get a handle on exactly what it is that your client does or wants to do. What are they offering? How do their products stand out from the crowd? What's special about them? What kind of image does the client want to project and why? As this suggests, business writing is almost always done as a collaborative process, as part of a team of some kind. There's not really a lot of scope for the kind of writer who prefers to work entirely on their own in this field. You're constantly having to take account of the views of other people, whether these are researchers, um, designers, marketing managers, or simply the people who run the client organisation that you're working for and who have their own ideas about what needs to be communicated and how this ought to be done. This can sometimes be quite frustrating, especially when an idea that you think is pure genius falls flat with a client, or when the client insists on including a whole load of information that you feel sure is simply going to bore people to death and do nothing to attract new customers. So I'm not saying that the client is always right, but you do have to listen to them, and it's often a process of negotiation. This is a quote from a man called John Simmons, who's written two of the best books I know about writing for business. You can see the titles here. What John highlights is one of the most important developments, I think, in recent years. And that's that business communication is becoming much more two-way. It's no longer all about the organisation and what it wants to communicate to consumers or to people who use it. It's also about what consumers or people who actually use the brand have to say themselves and whether or how the organisation listens and responds to that. In fact, it's about the conversations that take place between organisations and the people who use them. And of course, the internet has played a huge part in this development. Here's one example of a company that's particularly good at engaging its customers in conversation, I think. When you've got a moment, click through to their website and think about the role that writing plays in doing this. Now I hope that there'll be opportunities to work on some quite exciting live projects as part of the business writing unit. And it might be worth taking a quick look at some of the ones that we've done in the past few years. A couple of years ago, a group of students ran a big and quite complex communications project for the NSPCC. Uh, this involved working with illustrators, 
um, designers to produce a book of children's writing and also all of the accompanying publicity materials to help publicize and sell it. This website was part of that project. We were lucky enough to persuade the actress Tandy Newton to write a foreword for the book, which certainly helped get it noticed, and at last count it had made over £20,000 for the NSPCC. Another interesting project that a team of students worked on a while ago was a website for the nearest thing that Falmouth Art Gallery has had to a blockbuster show, which was called Surrealists on Holiday, and was all about Cornwall's historical connections with leading figures of the Surrealist movement. This involved coordinating closely with the gallery, of course, and with some of the artists involved also, working with a team of TV production students to research and make some short films for the site, researching a complex area of art history and making this accessible to a very broad audience, and also some rather tricky picture research, which included negotiating free use of copyright images by artists like um, Henry Moore, Max Ernst, Lee Miller, some of the most famous artists of the Surrealist movement. A project that's still very much ongoing is the website Creative Falmouth. That's all about presenting the Falmouth area as a thrumming hub of creative activity. Lucky, luckily enough, it is indeed that sort of area. This started with a great deal of research into how places develop strong brand images, looking at other examples from around the UK and around the world. Students then had to go and find examples of people in various different creative fields in the Falmouth area who are producing really exciting work and interview these for short profiles to be included on the site and these are accompanied by images taken by photography students at Falmouth. To produce this site they work closely with a well-known design agency based here, briefing the designers and thrashing out the various design concepts that they came up with. As I said Creative Falmouth is very much an ongoing project and researching and writing more of these profiles is certainly something that I'll be asking people on the business writing unit to do. Those were all examples of team projects, but students on the business writing unit are also very much encouraged to work with organisations or companies on an individual basis. The kind of projects that they've developed this way have included everything from leaflets or website copy to fairly major bits of work. One student, for instance, started out by writing a bit of website copy for an organisation of Cornish horticultural producers and ended up researching and writing their entire website, very large website, as well as doing all sorts of other copywriting for the organisation behind it, from press releases to um, banners and signage for the organisation's launch at Kew Gardens. Along with a case study on the project, this was something that she developed into her final MA and it helped her get a job working for quite a well-known copywriting agency later on. And I suppose the point of this story, really, is that what matters more than anything when you're making a career as a business writer is portfolio. And helping you to build up a varied portfolio of different types of work is really the ultimate aim of the business writing unit that I teach. Anyway, that's the end of my sales pitch. I promise I won't be doing nearly so much talking on the actual course itself, on the unit itself, because the whole point really is to get you looking at examples of business writing, analysing them, and producing work of your own. As with any kind of writing, that's the only way to learn. <laughs>